Okay, terrific. Thank you, Johannes. Okay, our next speaker is Joel Johnson from UT Austin, and he's going to be talking about using tsunami sediment transport experiments to improve paleohydraulic inverse models. Okay. All right. Okay, I can certainly humor, hear myself. I'm sure you can hear me too. So I think that I'm going to be talking about something a little different. First of all, it's physical experiments, it's physical tsunami models. But, you know, ending on that point of the challenges of sediment transport, I think was a nice segue. Um, the other thing is that I, when, when Robert Weiss ended his talk this morning, you know, it was talking about field data, but really about the needs and the challenges of, you know, getting the high quality data on sediment. And what I heard him describing the whole time was plume experiments. So this is what you know, basically, you know, the, the set of experiments that I'm going to talk about, I think, can, in a sense, do for, do for you. This is work that, that I've done with a variety of people. Katie Delbeck did a master's project um, collecting the data and doing some of the analysis. Also work with Juan Suck, Kim, and David Morig. I will say that most of what I'm talking about is published in a couple papers that you see here. Now, motivation is to be able to take sediment deposits and, of course, do the inverse problem. That's where I'm coming at this from, to, to basically, you know, see how well we can predict the flow depth and velocity, for example. I put both tsunamis and storm surges on there because... The, at least the models, and it's a particular advection settling model that I'm going to be talking about, you know, the model is simple enough that it really doesn't distinguish in terms of its, its inner physics between tsunamis and storm surges. So, you know, that right then and there, the fact that they're both there, kind of say there's still work to be done to refine and improve our understanding. And doing this, you know, the benefit is to improve risk estimates for coastal areas because, you know, we're talking about extreme events that happen rarely. Most people are familiar with that, that idea. Now, there's a variety of papers. This is certainly not um, complete, but taking, you know, sediment deposits and quantitatively trying to infer the wave characteristics done in a variety of different ways, but certainly what I'm talking about is relevant to, um, I would say, all of these approaches. And the big challenges with field data, you know, the big challenge with field data, while field data is great, is that you're chronically under constrained, and especially for the extreme events, both the rarity and just the difficulty to impossibility of making the measurements that you really want. And because of that, it's really hard to actually validate your models, right? You want to validate them independently of the, you know, exact events that you're trying to study. And flume experiments can, can let you do that. One other thing that, that I will say is, you know, I do think of these as physical models, but there are, I think, distinctions that are sometimes underappreciated between laboratory experiments and the models that, you know, this community and myself included develop because, you know, in the physical experiments, you know, we simplify the geometries, we simplify the boundary conditions, but we don't simplify the underlying physical processes and interactions that go on between the flow and the sediment. Whereas with equations that we develop, you know, those, that underlying physics is also simplified. So basically from these flume experiments, we're gonna to compare to one example of an advection settling model to look at both the accuracy and uncertainty of that model because uncertainties are critically important here. And you know, finally, a lot of what I'll talk about is, is not model validation or anything like that, but is just understanding and the still incomplete understanding of the transport physics of uh, suspended sediment 
in these experiments. In particular, you know, we'll be looking at grain size distributions along the flume and what controls them. And, you know, kind of a you know, simple way to state the results are that proximally, so over short transport distances, it's all about the source grain size distribution. That controls what the deposit is. As you go farther away, as you transport inland farther, in the case of a tsunami, your sediment deposits increasingly reflect the flow characteristics that we're trying to get out. So there is a spatial change from source to, to flow, I think. And I'm also going to focus on dispersion, which was left out of some models. And you know, I believe from these experiments that dispersion caused by turbulence is fundamentally important um, and needs to be included in models where it's not. So what were the experiments? Um, they were done in an outdoor flume at UT Austin. It's a you know, 32 meter long flume downstream of the lift gate. So there's a computer controlled lift gate where we can basically instantaneously release about six cubic meters of water at the upstream end of the flume. And it, it then you know, moves down the flume as a bore, you see there. And the first thing it hits is a source dune of sediment. So basically, the flow entrains sediment from that location. This would be like a you know, barrier island, coastal dune, basically a you know, idealized, localized source of sediment for the, for the experiment. It, you know, the sediment is entrained into the flow as the bore moves down the flume. And at the end of these experiments, you know, there, is a, there is a barrier perforated to reduce return waves. But basically water gets to the end, some sediment certainly goes out of the flume. And you know, then the sediment settles, finishes settling, I should say, and the flume slowly drains. I'm gonna present results from six experiments. All of the sediment was sand between about 100 to 900 microns. We used um, basically you know, some experiments used a finer grain size distribution um, within that range. Some used a somewhat coarser grain size distribution within that range. And we also varied the ponded water depth. So basically, you know, five of the six experiments started with ponded water. And, you know, this would represent a case like a shallow lagoon, you know, in a place where you're you know, most likely to preserve a tsunami or storm surge deposit in your flume. We collected data along the flume in terms of you know, flow depths and of course how they changed with time. ADVs measured the flow velocities and turbulence within the flow. And then afterwards we measured the thickness and grain size distribution of the deposited sediment along the flume. And this basically is what it looks like. So this is real time, so it's, and I paused. There, it's going again. This will go by um, pretty fast. So that's a bore. We give it about 20 seconds, and we have a tsunami experiment. You can see right now some billows of suspended sediment um, in that flow as well. I'm gonna try and go back something to, if I can successfully grab this. It's handy to actually look at this, you know, the wave actually coming in. You can see that there's actually, you know, a lot of aerated water at the beginning, but because of the ponded water, it takes a little bit of time, you know, again, fractions of seconds, to, but for, for the flow velocities to pick up near the bottom. And, you know, again, a little bit more time before a lot of the suspended sediment really comes into the system. So these are overlapping data from four different experiments that used basically the same initial, initial ponded water depth and other characteristics were the same to really show that the flows are pretty reproducible. You know, we get velocities that overlap for these. You can see turbulence um, in there. Higher velocities at first gradually decrease. You know, flow depth, you know, similarly, you know, goes up at first, gradually decreases, certainly some waves on the surface. 
we can calculate fruit numbers, and the fruit numbers were you know, around one for most of the experiments. Other, under some slightly different um, conditions here, and we had fruit numbers a little lower, a little higher, but that's the, that's the range that would flow that. Let's start looking at the sediment deposits. So here we're looking at the upstream end and um, moving along the flume, so flume so proximal to distal. And you know, again, there is an initial source dune at the upstream end, which was actually a fair bit deeper than um, four centimeters. It was about you know, 10, 12 centimeters um, deep at the, at the upstream end. I think that's right, that initial number. In any case, I keep falling off that. The deposits um, for the six different experiments looked fairly consistent. You can see that there's you know, a, a thicker part, you know, two to four centimeters in the upstream, roughly third of the flume. And then you get measurable deposits, but fairly thin, you know, measured in the, the several millimeter. Um, range at the downstream distal two thirds. And we can take these flow conditions, um, calculate a shear velocity, and then look at bed load velocities that you can predict from that using a relation from Raleigh Martin, what I'm using here. And basically, in these different experiments run under some different conditions you actually predict different distances that bed load should transport over the, over the duration of the, of the flow in the plume. And so these errors that I've drawn on here aren't just eyeballed to the data. They're actually independent calculations based on the shear velocity and the um, characteristics of the flow. And so you know, we're, we basically see this thicker pile of sediment at the upstream end corresponds quite nicely to the distance that you would expect bed load to transport, you know, be transported um, along the flume. And so we're interpreting this upstream coarser part as bed load transport. You can also think of it as just kind of shearing of the, shearing of that initial source dune, smearing out in that way. That said, there's also entrainment going on um, from the source dune and probably from in here as well. And so this upstream deposit, I think is really caused by a combination of bed load transport and deposition and suspended load um, deposition. Whereas we interpret the, the distal thin part as dominantly suspended load um, deposition. So let's look at what the um, deposit thick, uh, grain size distributions look like. This axis is transport distance, so moving down the flume. The green is actually thickness again for this one particular deposit. And you know, this asset axis is grain diameter. So we have D50, the median size. It's relatively you know, flat over the bed load zone. And then you see a decrease in grain size along the flume. And basically you see that pattern for both finer and coarser grain size percentiles. At this point, let me step back and say, you know, are these flumes realistic? Do they actually apply to natural systems? Well, here's a comparison to some field data from a 2006 um, event. And, you know, basically I've normalized grain size and normalized transport distance inland. But for the different grain size percentiles here, you know, we get reasonably consistent trends. So, you know, at least that makes me feel good about the grain size trends that we see. Of course, we've looked at, you know, a formal um, fruit number scaling. And, you know, I think of these experiments as, you know, one tenth to one hundredth scale models of natural events. And so if you use those scaling factors, you basically would say the, these experiments are representative of, you know, flow depths during a tsunami of three to 30 meters, you can see velocities. The durations probably are a little short compared to some field cases, but you know, one to four minutes of, of corresponding time. But I think that the, um, 
Scaling is good for the flow. It's also good for suspended sediment. So we can calculate Rouse numbers that indicate that the whole range of sediment sizes we're using is at least suspendable. Some of it still moves as bed load, but it is suspendable sizes. Let's now compare to a model. Well, Moore et al. and then um, John Woodruff et al., you know, with some modifications, presented an advection settling model. And the key here is that the combination of the grain size and the depth of velocity control how far grains move down, you know, downstream in the case of the flume or you know, inland. And that basically we can infer the depth of velocity. A fundamental variable in the, in the model is called the advection length scale. You calculate it from the average velocity, the average flow depth, and the average settling velocity. So basically, the advection length scale is how far you'd expect a grain to be transported um, along the flume if it started from the surface and settled down. I notated this a little different than is often used. To, to say that it's, it's a still water settling velocity or really an average settling velocity. And I'll come back to that later. But you know, turbulence will give you a distribution of settling velocities in reality. But that's not in this model. Really, the, the model is both of these equations, just crude number and that advection length scale. Now, an important assumption is that that distance that grains are transported by the flow corresponds to that advection length scale. They're not the same. One is a measured distance from the flume. One tells you about the flow depth and velocity and settling. But basically, you know, from these equations, we have two, two equations, two unknowns. We assume a fruit number and, um, or in this case of these experiments, calculate it and go from there. The one other thing that we need to do is take deposits along the flume and you know, pick a representative grain size with which to calculate a settling velocity um, to then go into the model. And so in this initial model, the way that that was done was the fairly reasonable assumption was made that the, the coarsest grain in a given location, let's say this grain, is the representative is, is going to be most representative for the flow characteristic. The idea is that for grain of a given size, the ones starting out highest in the flow get transported the farthest. And, and that basically those grains are going to be at a given location, the coarsest ones in the deposit. So these are some model results. Again, the initial model you know, was assumed to, to work for D95, or size fraction. And the, these, these diamonds are the D95 size along the flume. The green line is a fit to those data. You can see that it fits part of the data quite nicely, but it predicts a um, flow depth that's almost double what was actually the experimental flow depth. Here you see, you know, a calculation based on the experimental flow depth. And that actually matches the distal portion, the suspended portion of the flume um, quite nicely when using the D50 grain size. Now, upstream, you can see that the models don't really fit the data. And you can also see that the models are predicting a grain size. And the, predictions of the grain size of the models are really a lot larger than, and quickly get to be larger than the actual grain sizes that were in the surface. And so the short of it is that, you know, upstream data not matching the model is a source grain size distribution effect. There just aren't the grains there that would settle fast enough to meet the assumptions of the model. Now, another thing that we can do here is basically go along the flume, so again, upstream, downstream, and figure out you know, what grain size percentile, what percentile within the deposits best predicts the, um, 
experimental uh, flow conditions, the depth and velocity. And it, it varies for, for some experiments, and particularly these two, um, you know, at the end of the flume, you're still at a relatively high percentile, D80. And these were the experiments that used a finer grain size distribution as a source. Down here, you can see several experiments that use coarser grain size distributions. And those are met more by, you know, intermediate um, grain size percentiles around D50. Now, there were different advection length scales for those different sources. So basically because you know, the finer grains settle more slowly, that gives a longer um, advection length scale there. And so, you know, comparing the results at the same distance along the flume isn't necessarily ideal. And so basically I'm going to do a non-dimensional transport distance, normalizing the actual transport distance by the source advection length scale. And that does give a not perfect, but not terrible collapse of the data. So this would be a non-dimensional transport um, distance. And, and so basically, you know, interpretation here is that you have to be greater than an advection length scale um, for your um, deposits to, to really be sensitive to the actual flow conditions. And you know, upstream, you're basically much more representing the, the source um, grain size. Now, we can predict uncertainties um, for, for the different grain sizes um, from, from this. It's perhaps a little confusing, but basically for different grain size percentiles, I you know, calculated since 90 to 5% confidence intervals based on these six experiments. And so, you know, for an intermediate percentile, you know, a value of 0.5 here would say that we're predicting that within plus or minus 50% um, the, the flow depths and actually predicting velocities a little bit better. So we can look at uncertainties um, compared to the model with these, with these data. You also see in the middle, you know, you can pick a broad range of grain size percentiles and not have that much change in general uncertainty. So I am going to you know, try to do a little bit more to say, well, why is the D50 or an intermediate grain size better? And as I've you know, hinted and said, I think it basically is coming down to turbulence. And so you know, the turbulent velocity fluctuations mean that it's not just whether particles start high or low in the flow, it's whether they you know, happen to be dispersed farther or due to dispersion, transport a shorter distance along the flow. And so, you know, the assumption that the transport distance matches the advection length scale is basically going to be true for the average um, transport distance for grains, but not for the, the part influenced by dispersion. And, and the thing is that it's actually the tails of the of the um, distribution, say, of transport distances, it's those tails that represent the dispersion. And, and so basically, the grains of a given size class that go farthest down the flume represent the ones that happen to have been dispersed farther downstream. You basically have to make a mental calculation or you know, comparison to go from single grain size and how it's spread along the flume to vertically integrating what a grain size distribution would be. But you know, basically your finer grains at a given location, you know, the smaller percentiles are gonna represent you know, the grains that happen to be dispersed shorter distances or courses for the farther distances. Your intermediate grains, roughly D50, are the ones that are gonna represent your, your average settling. I'm gonna zoom through these quickly, but conceptually we can look at advection length scales versus the actual transport distance along the flume. And you know, now on, on a, an advection length scale, 
you basically would have coarser grains that got you know dispersed you know finer grains that got dispersed at um, this end and again if you take the same axes but now think in terms of at a given location along the flume what is the grain size distribution made up of these different sizes gonna gonna look at basically the finer percentiles are going to you know your your advection length scale will increase um, faster than your measured transport distance and vice versa for coarser grains well we can actually you know test test relations like this based on the flume experiments because again we know you know, we actually, because it's an experiment, independently know UH, we calculate um, the settling velocity. And we know the grain sizes, we know the transport distance. And so, you know, for D50, and we find, these are just two example experiments, we find that, um, yes, in fact, the measured transport distance is a good predictor of the advection length scales, and that we also have the expected trends that dispersion should give you for both coarser and finer grain size classes. So I am wrapping up. Um, honestly, didn't get as far with this as I wanted because you know, it's a work in progress. But the next step that I'm doing with a variety of people who have contributed in different ways is, is you know, putting together a simple particle tracking model basically where we can put in a grain size distribution, put in synthetic turbulence or you know, real time series of, of turbulence and, and look at how grains get um, transported and dispersed down a flume and make deposits. And I'm really excited about this because I have interpretations about dispersion, also about why resuspension and, and such should be relatively unimportant in these, in these experiments but they are interpretations. And so with a particle tracking model that makes deposits, I'm planning on testing the sensitivity to resuspension and various other factors. So to conclude, um, I am honestly surprised that more work hasn't been done using flume experiments to do tsunamis, storm surges, rapidly changing flows, because the scaling actually works out um, quite well. And I do think of this as a benchmark data set that I hope that people use, please do. I'm happy that um, Pang and Weiss have used it for um, some of their model validation. And you know, another thing is just some models oversimplify the physics. We all kind of know that, but dispersion, leaving dispersion out was kind of a simplification too far, I think, for some inversion models that have been picked up and used basically because they weren't rigorously tested ahead of time based on flume experiments, for example. And then a couple of details specific to these, these experiments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joel. Are there a couple of questions? Raleigh. I'm just curious, um, are you assuming basically that the different particle size classes don't interact with each other and treating them in terms of one another? So, short answer is yes, absolutely. The, the advection settling model assumes that in what I've done with this, um, I am assuming that as well. I certainly appreciate that that isn't necessarily true. And you know, smaller grains can damp turbulence, larger grains can enhanced turbulence. I would say that the understanding of applying that to deposits like this isn't yet at that level of, of the underlying physics and you know, maybe it should be. Just to follow up, I actually think that that's a pretty valid assumption. I was wondering more about the initial entrainment of those particles into the flow. I mean, perhaps the initial flood wave is so energetic that you just assume all the particles are going to be. Yeah, yeah. So I think that you can, you can find many papers when you go looking for this that make the comments that we don't understand entrainment into suspension really well and that it's hard to predict. And so I, I didn't show them. There's actually some hints in these data that the entrainment into suspension is grain size dependent, even for these sands. 
That is the opposite of what my intuition would say. I'm not totally sure it's true. We're way above the thresholds of motion for these grains. I would think that they were just being trained independently in, of size. There's some trends in the grain size data that suggest otherwise. That's what research is all about. So figuring out new questions. As you know, many traditional sediment transport study, they try to try to quantify the amount of bed load and suspended load using the four parameter, which I think is the ratio of settling velocity versus shear velocity. Mm -hmm. So I think one intuitive uh, intuition regarding the scale effect is that in the real field situation, your shear velocity, bottom shear velocity could be much, much larger. So you may not even have bed load in the field conditions. So I wonder what is your... Yeah, so, so thank you for saying that. So the, the Rouse number that I briefly showed up